Hi, this is Ben with Novalux Stereophonic, and today in front of us I have something very cool to share. This is a set of Marantz Model 9 70 watt EL34 tube monoblocks. The Marantz 9 is one of the most sought after tube amplifiers of all time. It's beautiful in both the way that it looks and how it sounds, and even how it feels. They're just awesome to interact with and, and great amplifiers in every way. So in this video, I'd like to share a little bit of history on these units, a detailed look at the restoration that I completed on this pair, um, we'll look at all the front panel controls and, and all the functions and what they do, and then finish up with some bench tests. So if that sounds interesting, stick around. Let's start with a little bit of Marantz history. So the Model 9s are from the very first era of Marantz. This is what's considered the golden age. It's Saul Marantz, Sid Smith, Dick Sequeira. That's, that's the, the first era. So this is East Coast Marantz, completely different from what happened on the West Coast with Marantz production, and then later with the stuff that happened in Japan. So these are pretty far removed from something like a Marantz 2270, which is an iconic Japanese receiver. This is East Coast American tube, awesome build quality, just amazing pieces of electronics. That first series started numerically with the, the Model 1, and that was an, an evolution from something that Saul Marantz was building in his, his home in New York, I believe. So the Model 1 was a mono preamplifier, followed by the Mono Model 2, which was a mono amp. The Model 3 was a mono crossover network. Model 4 was the power supply for the Model 1. Model 5 was another uh, monoblock amplifier. And back in the day, there was really no stereo. It was available in the movie theaters and stuff, but it hadn't came into the, uh, come into the homes yet because there wasn't stereo broadcasts on the radio and there wasn't stereo media that you could go out and buy and reproduce until you know late 50s, early 60s. So when that started to roll around, instead of designing a stereo preamplifier from scratch, the first thing that Marantz did was build the Model 6 which was a stereo adapter that allowed you to take two Model 1s and pair them up um, to make a stereo preamp. So after that, the logical thing was to build that dedicated stereo preamp, and that was the Marantz 7, which is just an iconic 12AX7 based tube uh, stereo preamp that is considered one of the best of the best from this era. Uh, after that was the Model 8, followed shortly after by the 8B. So that's a stereo power amplifier. So again, we're in the stereo realm. And then the, the Model 9, which we have here, the whole concept with these was that you would buy a stereo pair and maybe pair this up with the Marantz 7 and then have a dedicated amplifier for each of your two channels. So this was really at the, at the top end. And then the, the Marantz 10 and 10B, the 10B is, is basically one of the best tuners ever produced. And, and it led to some financial issues with Marantz because of just the crazy amounts of R&D that went into that device and eventually led to the sale of the company and movement across to California and later to Japan. So these were kind of near the, uh, the end of production in New York. These were produced from roughly 1960 to 1967. Uh, and they were, I think, meant to compete directly with Macintosh. So Macintosh kind of cornered the market for high power, low distortion, high fidelity amplifiers. They they had the, their patents on the Unity coupled circuit, which allowed their amplifiers to just smack uh, the specs of anything else. Um, nothing could really come close. So the, the Model 9 was a device that was engineered to perform at that top level right up with the Macintosh components. So with that, let's jump into the front panel and take a look at what all these knobs and switches do. So this is what a Marantz 9 looks like lit up. So the, the meter immediately catches your eye. And this, this whole thing is just very enjoyable to look at with the kind of champagne anodized aluminum and the meter, it just draws you in. And Saul Marantz, I, I believe, had a background in industrial design. So all of the equipment from that early American era is just, just timeless, basically. Uh, there's, there's elements of symmetry here that kind of make everything flow. And then a couple design flares that are still present in Marantz equipment today. So this kind of set the standard for uh, the high-end Marant. So this this here is a cover. You can pull this off. It just uses um, almost like a banana plug type, type thing. So this is just held in with spring tension into here. This design element was recycled in a few Marantz products. So the Model 500 was a very high-end power amplifier that was uh, made during the, the West Coast California era of Marantz. 
And then that design element again was used in some of the esoteric series that Marantz produced later on. The meter can also be seen even today on modern Marantz surround receivers. It's usually dead center in the middle of a black piece of equipment, backlit blue with the Marantz logo and a little star in the middle. So this thing was definitely uh, an important piece for Marantz and, and setting a, a design standard for many years to come. So let's take a look at the, uh, the controls and operation of this thing. So let's, let's start off right here. So all that's underneath here is a terminal block and an RCA connector. So this of course is your input for your signal. And then here are the speaker connections. So we have the, the, the standard common four, eight and 16 ohm taps that we usually see on tube amplifiers, but they've also provided a one ohm tap. That is not for connecting a one ohm speaker. It is for connecting uh, what they refer to as a phantom center channel. So in the manual it outlines how to do this. It's a little bit confusing, so I do wanna go over it here. So I guess the idea was, Back in the day, if you have a very large room with two speakers on either side of the room that you can't step far back enough to, to get a stereo image or the space is just so big, you get an empty hole in the middle and it sounds kind of disjointed because you have a left channel and a right channel and there's nothing coming together in between common between the channels. So one of the solutions they had was adding a center channel speaker that would get a signal that was an L plus R. You get both channels combined together coming out of the center to kind of fill in the gap in the stereo image. So the way that that was pulled off was they installed this normal and reverse phase circuit. So the idea here is that normally both amplifiers, if you're just using two speakers, would be in the normal phase. They would operate in the same polarity and everything would, uh, would be coherent. Now, if you're running this phantom center channel setup, the idea is that you would reverse this phase on one of the amplifiers. Now, if you left the speakers connected like normal for your left and your right, if there was a, a pulse that pushed the cone out in the right speaker, it would suck the cone in in the left speaker. They, they're inverse in phase. So that had to be corrected. So you would take your left or your right channel and just reverse your positive and negative wires. Putting the two amplifiers out of phase relative to one another, when a speaker is connected across the one ohm taps, that gives you an L plus R signal. If you didn't use this switch and they were just both set to normal and you plugged in the center that way, you'd actually get a difference channel. So you get the difference between uh, L and R rather than the addition of those two channels and you would get almost no information if the recording didn't have uh, you know, a, a very wide stereo image. So that's, that's what this normal and reverse phase switch is for and I will show you what this looks like on a scope to help you better understand how that control works. The next one down here is a low filter, and this is basically just like a rumble or a subsonic filter to prevent uh, like your, your speaker cones from pulsing in and out uh, from different anomalies or for turntable rumble and stuff like that. So this is something that you can just engage and anything below uh, 20 hertz gets attenuated at a approximately 12 dB per octave filter. So that's a really, really sharp filter that, that, um, that cuts down the frequency pretty quickly after 20 hertz. Over here we have a volume attenuator. This is directly connected to the RCA plug. So when the signal comes in here, it will travel through this before it goes to the other circuitry. So this allows you to dial back uh, the signal. If you're plugging a source directly into these, like a CD player, you could technically adjust your volume here. Otherwise it's used to kind of um, establish the proper gain uh, structure as you go through from source to preamp to power amp. On this side, we have the power switch. This is just simple, turns the unit on and off. and that is um, not present on an 8B. The 8B, I guess, was probably designed to be turned on directly from the Marantz 7, uh, and that one does not have a power switch. So the Marantz 9 does have the ability to power on and off by itself. And my guess is it's because it could cause too much inrush current draw if you plug two of these into a Marantz 7. That's just me speculating. We've got a fuse holder here, and um, this control here corresponds to everything here. So we'll talk about that next. So one of the great things about the Marantz 9 is it was designed with a set of test parameters. So the 8B had this as well, as well, but the 9 takes it one step further by giving the end user the ability to adjust AC balance without external equipment. So in the Marantz 8B, to adjust the AC balance, that's basically making sure that the signal clips evenly um, and every, everything is aligned, uh, basically centered out. So. Um, you have the least amount of distortion. On the Marantz 8B to set that, you have to stimulate the device by plugging a test signal, like a one kilohertz sine wave into the RCA and bringing the amplifier into clipping and doing the adjustment that way. This unit uses 
a feature where it, it, it steps down the, uh, the level of the incoming AC voltage on one of the power transformer secondaries gives you a, a 60 hertz signal to take the amplifier into clipping and allows you to set it that way. So I've always thought that on a fixed bias amplifier, which means you have a negative grid bias to set the bias rather than a cathode resistor, on any amp like that, I think it's a disservice to not provide something like this. So the, the best tube amplifiers um, from an end user standpoint are ones where the end user has a little meter attached or they have little bias points where they can plug in a multimeter and make adjustments to set the bias themselves. There's certain amplifiers out there like a, um, an Audio Research D150 comes to mind. I think that's the one that I've worked on before with uh, four 6550s per channel. Just to adjust the bias on that requires six clip leads and, and at least two multimeters. And it would be almost impossible for an end user to set it and not burn themselves or blow up their amplifier. So this, this design really takes care of that. So an end user can swap output tubes, bias them up and check and make sure everything's operating properly. So let's go through that right now. So first we're gonna, we're gonna look at the bias. If I click this over into the V8 bias position, this is great. It puts extra brightness into the meter. I'm gonna try to get this tamed down so we can see this. It's not going to cooperate. So the brightness indicates that you can better read the meter. And then you just get a flathead screwdriver in here and adjust the control until the needle lands right on the bias mark. And then you just go through your other output tubes and make sure that everything's biased up properly. It's basically the easiest bias adjustment that, that I've ever seen on an amplifier. Next up is the DC balance. And this, the goal is just to, to make sure that it's staying very close to that balance mark there. So if I go over into DC balance, we'll see that the, the needle is lining up basically right on the zero. And sorry if this is, this is difficult to see, I'm gonna try and post to dim this down a little bit so that there's more contrast here. And then on the AC balance, we, we push and hold the switch into this position, it's spring loaded here. And then we're going to be adjusting this AC balance control to get it to line up right there. And there is a note in the manual not to hold it there too long because this is stressing out the amplifier. Again, it's taking it up into clipping. So, but it's disconnected from the speaker. There's a big resistor in the bottom that takes the load, but um, you don't want to run it on the AC balance setting for very long. And that's why they, they made that switch spring loaded. So you can't accidentally uh, put it there, stress out the amp and burn up the load resistor. Um, I guess that's about it for the front panel. So uh, I'm gonna spin this thing around and we will take a look at the, um, at the triode pentode switch before we open these up and start looking at the restoration. This is what a Marantz 9 looks like from the back. We've got the serial number located here. The serial number is also usually printed uh, under the chassis, but not always. In this example pair, one had a stamp, one did not. To pull the top cover, it's two screws near the front and then two back here. Looking at the back of the sample fire with the cover off, on this one immediately, this is, this is not an original part. Originally, this cap will be the same color as this one. This size is correct, but this has definitely been replaced in the past. We have our four EL34 output tubes. This is the triode versus 70 watt switch. So when you're in 70 watt mode, the amplifier is operating in um, ultra linear mode, meaning there's two extra output transformer primary taps that are connected to the screen grids of these tubes. And what it does is it maximizes the performance so that you get the highest, most efficient power transfer and least amount of distortion. So in 70 watt mode, you're using the EL34s uh, you know, to, their, to their full extent in this circuit. These tubes are arranged in what's called a parallel push-pull configuration. So these two tubes take one uh, side of the waveform and these take the other, and they work in equal and opposite across the output transformer. The 8B, for example, uses one pair per channel. So this is just two tubes, two tubes per swing rather than the single uh, pair that's in each channel of an 8B. When we flip it into triode mode, what happens electronically is the screen grid, which is part of that ultra-linear circuit, gets tied to the plate and effectively connects these output tubes as triodes. So what results from that is lower output power. So you only get 40 watts in this configuration rather than 70 watts in ultra linear. And it um, changes the harmonic characteristic. So it operates more like, I guess it would sound more like a single ended amplifier than a push pull amplifier uh, to, to some degree. What I've heard people describe a triode versus ultra linear switch doing is if you have a very uh, nice listening space with a well-treated room and, and great speakers, 
and you can produce almost like a three-dimensional soundstage. When you're flipping between ultra linear and triad mode, a lot of times it's described as a change in the depth of the image. Like you might be shifting the, the image back or forward uh, with this switch. So it's more of just a, a user preference. I did notice if you flip the switch while the amplifier is on, you can get a loud transient through the speakers. So I recommend only flipping the triad 70 watt switch while the unit is off. Also this red cap, one of these amplifiers has it, one of them doesn't. Um, on the nines that I've worked on, I think they've all had a cap but only some are red. I may be wrong on that. In the comments, you can correct me if you've seen other things there. Uh, we've also got a 6CG7 and two 6DJ8s, which are part of the driver and phase inverter circuits. Before we move on to the bench, I just wanted to go over a couple of things. If you remember looking at that iconic front faceplate, the um, company that owned uh, the Marantz name during the 1990s, commissioned a company called VAC, uh, Valve Amplification Company, to reproduce certain iconic Marantz models, and one of the ones they re reproduced was the Model 9. So be aware of that. It's a extremely good replica. It's it's as close as you can get to an original one without, without buying an original one. They look almost identical, so if you're in the used market looking for a, a pair of Marantz 9s, just make sure you know what you're getting, because you might be getting a reissue, and the value usually isn't as high as an original set, just for historical reasons. There are also um, some other versions of the Marantz 9. I believe it's called the Marantz 9R, which has an extended faceplate with rack ears on it, so another cool thing to look out for. Okay, this is what the amplifiers look like post-restoration. So as you can see, I've, I've done my best to try to make them as identical as possible. Um, on, on this design stock, these use these good all Mylar capacitors. And these tend to hold up very well considering their age. What, what I usually do with these is I will lift one leg of, of the part and test it for leakage and value. And if it passes, I, I try to leave them in because they, they contribute to kind of the signature sound of these amplifiers. But in, in this case, I didn't really have that option because both units had been previously serviced. So judging by the parts, I think this might've been done sometime around the 1980s, but I'm not really sure. I wasn't around back then recapping devices. So uh, maybe some of you can tell by the, the parts that were used, kind of the time frame in which these were these were serviced or modified. So what I had was two, two different sets of parts. So often with nines, they, they, you don't find them in match sets. You find one and then a couple years later you find another and then people are pairing them up. So um, what I've got here is this one was done mostly with the orange drop capacitors and the circuit was left uh, mostly stock. In the other one, this one seemed like more of an upgrade. So somebody had replaced um, a few of the power supply capacitors, so the voltage doubler was uh, uh, got new caps, and then they used a lot of these what look like polypropylene tubular capacitors. Um, so, the, and this one had had a few other parts changed and stuff. It looks like someone was trying to to improve the sound in some way. Um, my goal for this restoration was to bring these units back to the stock schematic since they've been modified, and then make them as equal as possible. So with those original caps gone, I opted to go with um, uh, tried and true IC axial polypropylene caps. These I have had really good experience with. They measured dead on the spot um, and they have really long leads, which makes them uh, particularly easy to work with in an amplifier that uses um, pegboard like this. So that's why I chose to go with these caps. Um, I was very careful when desoldering components to make sure that I left the terminals very clean and I didn't go crazy wrapping the, the components around multiple times just in case another technician or another owner in the future wants to go in and maybe change the 0.01 capacitors to something that's more of an audio grade cap. So for me the goal is just to get these um, back to the stock, stock schematic and sounding really good. So um, next up I'm going to zoom in on one of the, the chassis and discuss in detail uh, what went on in this restoration. Let's start with a look at the power supply rebuild. So in the nine, the power supply uses a voltage doubler circuit, which uses two identical capacitors. One of them is mounted on the outside and the other is mounted inside of this clip. And those are kind of the first stage of, of filtration after the uh, rectifier diodes. 
what I do with those is I, I like to preserve the, the look of the, the chassis from the outside. Marantz used a kind of off gray Sprague long life capacitor and it kind of matches with the brown. If that gets changed to a silver can, it can look a little bit off. So I like to um, use modern uh, components that are the same value but much smaller and mount them inside of the chassis. So what I've done here is I've built a small package that uh, consists of two capacitors equal in value to the originals um, that have the same diameter as the, the original that would fit in, fit in this clip. So this is basically the plus and minus of these two capacitors wired together and then the three contact leads coming off and, and wired into the circuit. So that's just living right inside this clip here. And then I rebuild the three section capacitor on a terminal block here. And uh, again, that's just to um, to keep the original look of the outside of the unit. There's plenty of space in here to make that happen. And then for the, the diodes, I replaced those with a, an ultra fast diode. Um, the diode technology has come a long way since then. Uh, some people will just use a single diode. This, this is not a bridge rectifier. This is just a full wave rectifier with a center tap. So you really only need two diodes. The original design uses two in series um, for each swing. In here, I've duplicated that for a couple reasons. Um, just a little bit of safety mar uh, margin for uh, peak inverse voltage, and also to keep the original look. It looks kind of strange if you just jump a couple diodes across the pins here and leave these terminals blank. So again, that's, that's why it's uh, to preserve the original look and just to add a little bit of safety margin. So while we're on the subject of diodes, let me show you the Zener diode that's used in this circuit. So there's a 150 volt Zener diode that's used for um, regulation of one of the early stages. And the original looks like this. And Zener diodes in general are just a possible point of failure. And this part, I guess maybe they just weren't uh, very good at making Zeners back in the day. The tolerance on this is like 20%, where modern Zeners are like 5% and below for the most part. So that's been replaced with a, a modern uh, part here, and it has a very consistent voltage drop. So that's that. Um, that diode there. Um, also in that area of like miscellaneous components in here is a neon lamp. This neon's working fine and it sees very little use, but the part number is still available, the exact part, so I ended up putting that in. So that neon is located there. And you don't see that on all Marantz 9s. I've seen a couple that don't have that, but I've always added it back in um, because of its function and circuit. So if we look at the schematic, the, the neon is right here in this tube stage. And I'm not 100% on this, but I'm pretty sure what this is doing is protecting this tube stage um, while the amplifier is warming up and it might not be in, in conduction yet. So uh, this, this, this tube section here is direct coupled to the previous stage. There's no coupling capacitor blocking DC. So the plate voltage that ends up on this tube um, will be coming right into the grid here. And until this tube has come up to operation and the cathode voltage is stabilized, um, the, there's a potential that you could um, drive this grid positive and, and just overheat the tube or something. So what, what this neon does is right when you power on the amplifier, it turns on and then fades slowly over about two seconds and then the amplifier is back into its normal operating condition. So that neon gets replaced there just for good measure, but I'm sure the originals would last for years and years because it only gets used when the unit powers on. There wasn't a whole lot in the first amplifier that needed uh, replacement besides bringing everything back to, to equal with the other amplifier. So that was actually the easier one to work on because it was more stock. Uh, there were some uh, modifications that I did need to re reverse, but they were pretty straightforward. So this section here is the, the input, uh, input subsonic filter and uh, reverse and normal selection. So uh, the various components will be in circuit depending on how you've selected the switches on the front. So you can bring in and out the subsonic filter or you can select between um, a uh, unity gain plate driven circuit for the first stage or a cathode follower for the first stage. So that's all done here. And what uh, somebody had done was they hooked this 6.8K resistor up to the normal phase switch or normal and reverse switch and, and tied it in directly to the volume control. And this was actually a really clever idea. What it does in essence is bypasses the entire first uh, tube stage. So it takes all of this stuff, which is basically just feature driven, and it, it 
comes right to this uh, right to the the input of this potentiometer and takes the signal into the grid of this stage. So basically bypassing all of the optional features. So that was actually kind of a cool modification that um, was simple and and had a, a good use. But I actually I actually found it on accident. I didn't know it was was done that way because it was kind of hidden between the switches. This resistor it was it was mounted in between these two switches. Um, I found it by flipping the reverse switch and having my volume increase and I had no volume adjustment. And then I dug into it and basically this red wire down here had been removed in one of the amplifiers. Uh, so I just had to remove this resistor and jump that back to where it was supposed to be and then everything was good. So what I have here is just a, a collection of some of the resistors that needed to get replaced. This was a um, screen grid resistor that had broken apart. When I started working on the unit, this was cracked, but it still had resistance, so the unit still worked. But uh, with that like that, it needed to get replaced. So all, um, all four of the screen grid resistors, which are here, got replaced in all, um, in all positions on both amplifiers. Uh, this guy here was in the, um, the grid circuit right there, it had just drifted, it was 20% it was out. Um, so I replaced that uh, with, a, um, with a new old stock carbon comp part. And then also in the, in the first amplifier, the one with the orange caps, some of the screen resistors were incorrect value. So this was um, not the, the correct 100 ohm that it should have been. So those got replaced along with the, the cracked one. Also in the amplifier with the orange caps, I had a faulty power switch. And this was a weird one. Basically what happened is every time the switch was engaged um, at power off, there would be a huge spike and thump through the speakers. Uh, very, very loud. Um, and as you were turning it off, it didn't cleanly snap into the on and off position. There was like a, an arcing and crackling that happened in between the switch. And I didn't really catch it until I was doing listening tests because at the bench, I usually have these connected to a, um, a current limited supply and I'm switching it on and off with, a, with an external switch. So during the listening tests, I caught that one. Luckily, I had a very similar switch um, and the, the rubber booty fit right onto the bat. So it was, it was like a, um, just a, a happy coincidence that I had the correct part in my stash. So that was about it for the first amplifier. The second one was, was much more involved. So in addition to rebuilding the power supply, replacing the Zener, the Neon, um, and checking all the resistors, that one had been heavily modified, so I had some other work to do. Now, this I've, I've seen before. Um, I've never fully bought into this, but I haven't experimented with it myself, so I can't really talk on it. Maybe some of you in the comments can, can judge this. But a lot of times when I'm working on stuff that was what the service years ago, I think there was a fad of, of paralleling uh, larger value capacitors with smaller uh, value film caps. And in this case, it was a, a smaller value cap and then an even smaller value cap. And these were in position where it's supposed to be a 0 0.01 microfarad cap. So someone had made the judgment to change the value to one microfarad. And um, usually when you do that, you have to adjust the, the grid resistor or you end up with... Um, an RC time constant mismatch. And this amplifier, the frequency response was, was not where it was supposed to be. Um, at about five kilohertz, it would start rolling off when it's supposed to start to roll around like 17 or 18 kilohertz. So some of the modifications that were done with this actually hurt its frequency response. So those just got replaced with um, these 0 0.01 microfarad um, axial films. Along that same topic, the grid resistors were replaced with the correct value, uh, 1K in this case, and those would go here. But the type is incorrect. These are likely metal film, and the originals are carbon composition. Uh, so what I did is, in this case, I had new old stock Allen Bradley carbon compositions. So I, I, uh, the original stayed in the first amplifier and in, in this amplifier that was further modified, it got new old stock carbon compositions so that both of them matched. Another resistor change that I dealt with was in this section here. These are what are called um, deposited carbon in the, in the manual, which uh, corresponds to carbon film resistors. So those got replaced in both amplifiers because I needed them to match. This one also got a, a strange modification. The screen grid resistors were upgraded from uh, half watt to one watt. And the strange thing is these all showed signs of thermal stress. Let me see if I can find a good one. 
And this one here, it was basically had evidence of getting hot and kind of melting a little bit. They were still fine for value, but really that wattage is not needed there. When the circuit was operating, I measured the voltage drop across these and it was less than a volt. So there's not much current going through those screen grid resistors and there was no need to really up that. And what that you know more indicates is that the, there was probably another issue with the circuit or maybe the tubes were biased way too hot because um, that, that shouldn't be the case that those resistors overheat. It is a common failure point, but I don't really see the need to up, up it to, to one watt. Um, it could be a good safety margin, but in this case, I just went back to what um, Brantz had originally installed. On the modified amplifier, somebody had put a gold-plated RCA jack in it and the other one had an original jack. So to make them equal again, I installed a, uh, a new set of gold-plated RCA jacks so that both of them matched. The last thing that I want to talk about here on the restoration is these plate chokes. These are often seen on Macintosh amplifiers on their Unity coupled circuit and also in uh, what are called push-pull parallel amps, um, ones that use multiple output tubes and just a, instead of just a single push-pull pair. So um, I'm going to change the camera angle and we're gonna go into detail on uh, what I found here. So in the amplifier that was less modified, it had the original plate chokes in it. This is just a, an inductor. It's rated at 3.3 micro Henry um, with kind of a uh, resting DC resistance of uh, 0.33 ohms. So this is just used um, as far as I know to prevent parasitic oscillation in these uh, parallel output circuits. So in the modified amplifier, these had been replaced with wire wound 0.33 ohm resistors. And I'm not sure exactly why this was done. In theory, this, this is a wire wound design, so it should have some inductance and, and, and uh, actually help with the parasitic oscillation to some degree, but the value is not really correct. So I ended up having to find a replacement part for these and replace all four of them so that they would match. So I just wanted to do a demonstration of kind of the conclusion I came to here. So this LCR meter is not incredibly accurate, but it, it will give a reference on the, the replacement part. So I've got this set um, to show us the test result in micro Henry's here. So this one's coming out, it's supposed to be 3.3 my meters measuring it at 4.2. That's one of the original ones. If I measure one of the ones that was replaced with a resistor, the, the inductance on that resistor is much lower. So about one micro Henry. So the, the modified part wasn't really doing the same thing as far as inductance goes. And then if we look at the other parameter of, of DC resistance on the original, let's see if I can get this clipped in here. The original part is around that 0.33 ohm. Um, my meter leads are contributing to about 0.1 ohm here. So figure about 0.3 for this part. And then again, we should have about the same resistance on this one. So I'm not sure exactly what happened. It's sometimes easy to get these confused and think that they're a resistor without looking at the schematic. So it's possible that someone thought this was a 0.33 ohm resistor and just thought that they were doing an upgrade and replacing it with a better part. Um, or it's completely possible that this works fine in the circuit and, and this is completely fine to use. But again, this was in the amplifier that had bad frequency response issues. This was just for, like I said, oscillation prevention, but um, it obviously was not what was supposed to be in there. So what I did find was a modern component that is 3.3 micro Henry, and it's spec'd at something like point, uh, 0.29 ohms. So looking at the, the DC resistance on the replacement part, we're right around that same 0 0.3, 0 0.4 ohms where it's supposed to be. So it was good on that parameter. And then for inductance, remember we were at, I think four point, was it 4.3? So inductance is, is right in there. So this is the part that I ended up using. It's considerably smaller than the, uh, than the original as far as form factor goes, and it may not have the same internal construction, but I'm just looking to get it as close to, to factory as possible. Now, one of the advantage actually with this, 
being a, a 0.33 ohm resistor, is I was able to measure the voltage drop across this in circuit and calculate the amount of current that passes through this. So this is just basically the plate current, and I was able to meet that spec with this smaller part. So that's what got installed. So that's about it for the um, for the restoration. It was it was pretty involved. It was almost a full rebuild of the of the amplifiers um, and a check of all the resistors. But I'm really happy with how it turned out in the end. And next we will put these up on the bench and see how they test. I just realized that I forgot to discuss one of the most important parts of a vintage tube restoration, and that is the bias supply. So the, the bias supply is what supplies the negative grid voltage um, to all of the output tubes. That's what gets adjusted with the, with the front meter. If the negative bias supply goes away, the, the tubes have nothing keeping them from uh, running away and either melting or popping a fuse uh, in the amplifier. So you definitely want a stable negative uh, bias supply. So this one got a, um, a modern diode and then because of the pegboard design, axial capacitors are the best choice um, just for fitment inside of the unit. Um, but sometimes it's hard to, to find very long life axial capacitors. So I, I spent a little bit more on these just to make sure that I got a really high quality long life fiche uh, part in there that's gonna be um, in there for the long haul. And then there's also a couple other axial elect electrolytics in the, the, the front end circuit, which I did Sprague Adams just to, to look the part. All right, let's move on to the bench. I've got both of the Model 9s hooked up here at the bench warming up. Uh, my AC mains right now is sitting at about 123 volts, so that's where we're going to be doing these tests. I'm going to run through um, a few different things. We're going to do a output power test in ultralinear mode and triode mode, uh, take a look at the frequency response, and uh, look at the THD and see how everything matches up to the spec sheet, and more importantly, how close these amplifiers perform to one another. So the main shot that we're going to be looking at is up here on most of the bench, I want to be able to look at uh, the distortion analyzers, the scope, um, and everything all at once. So let's, uh, let's get started with some power tests. All right, we're gonna start with a power test in ultra linear mode. So these amplifiers are rated at 70 watts per chassis into an eight ohm load. So both amps are hooked up to my eight ohm dummy load. I'm monitoring the signal across the load on this oscilloscope and also monitoring the output level um, with my distortion analyzers here. So let me go ahead and turn on a signal. So what I have going on here is both channels are displayed, one on the blue trace, one on the yellow trace, and I just overlaid them so that we can see the channel balance. And right now I'm feeding about two volts peak to peak into the amplifiers and they're putting out right around 14 volts RMS. So I've got the volume control on both of them um, cranked up to maximum and my channel balance is looking really really good you can see I'm, I'm very close uh, here so what I'm gonna do is just slowly raise my signal generator until these amplifiers hit clipping and then we'll do a calculation on the output power so that's clipping right there and it looks like about 25 volts RMS I back it down to right about there 24.3, but you can see the channel balance is near perfect, which is awesome. These are performing really well. Um, if I switch this, we're gonna look at this in more detail a little bit later with a low distortion oscillator, but if I kick this into um, THD mode and I take this up into clipping, you'll see that the THD doesn't really rise until the clipping really starts here at, at, um, at the top. So. Overall looking really good. So at the top here, let's go back to level. Yeah, let's say 24.3 volts RMS. So I'll do a quick calculation on that. So if I take that 24.3 times 24.3 and divide it by eight ohms, I'm at 73.8 watts. All right, I'm gonna power down the amplifiers and switch them into triode mode, and we're gonna see if it meets that spec of about 40 watts in triode mode. So I'm gonna bring down the level of my signal generator significantly here. All right, so there's both signals again, and I'm just going to ramp this up until we hit clipping.
and there it is right there. So obviously much lower than it was before. I'm at about 19 volts RMS here. Let's see where our THD is. So yeah, I'm gonna come down to right about there, maybe even a little bit further. Okay, let's see where we're at here. 18 volts RMS. Do a quick calculation, 18 times 18 is 324, divide that by our load of eight ohms, and we have 40.5 watts. So basically these amplifiers are performing dead on for uh, maximum output power. This test is done at one kilohertz. Um, next, we're going to move on to frequency response, which is going to involve uh, making some plots with my oscilloscope and signal generator. One of the biggest challenges with this specific project was the fact that these amplifiers were differently constructed from one another. So they had different frequency response characteristics to begin with. So part of this process here was getting them as equal as possible so that when we do a frequency response plot that they track together. So when they're used in a stereo pair, you get a, um, an accurate representation of both the left and right channel. So the way that we're gonna do that is with a, a frequency response plot um, between the oscilloscope and the signal generator. So uh, this is actually a unique pairing, these two signal devices. I've got them connected over IP. So when I set up the parameters in the oscilloscope, it will send a signal to the signal generator and tell it what um, frequency to operate at. And we'll see this sweep through a range um, to give us these measurements. So first off, I have to set this up. So the, the spec sheet, it gives frequency response specs at full rated power and also at a half watt. Um, I'm less concerned about the frequency response at rated power because you're not going to be listening that loud. It's more just for the, the spikes and stuff and different parts of the music. You're gonna be listening probably around a couple watts on, on this thing. So when, when we do the, uh, the frequency response at a half watt, it should correspond to the full output power. I also don't wanna be running my dummy load that long because the sweep takes quite a while to complete. So first I wanna set my stimulus level. Um, so I'm looking for a half watt here. So what I'm going to do is um, just adjust the signal generator until I get two volts RMS, um, which corresponds to one half watt into an eight ohm load. I have a little bit of a discrepancy here, but I think I'm just going to leave it. We'll see just a bit of a deviation in the curve. So while we're doing this, I also wanna track um, uh, the deviation in dB here. So I'm gonna set this one kilohertz frequency and two volts RMS equal to half watt output um, in as my zero dB mark. Now on my analyzer here, for some reason I've lost my dot digit. The main thing is that these are displaying this, uh, the same thing essentially. So what's gonna be displayed up here is the deviation from zero dB. And what we're looking for is less than, uh, than 0.1 dB through the audio band and up to, point, uh, up to 0.3 dB, I think is what the spec was. I'll double check that. But anyways, let's get this, uh, let's get this started here. So I know I'm gonna want a 2.78 millivolt um, stimulus here. So let me set our sweep and we're gonna go from Let's go 12 hertz to 40 kilohertz. Go a little bit outside of the band on both sides. And our stimulus is going to be, we'll do 2.7 millivolts to get us close enough, or 270 millivolts. All right, offset. This should be good. So now we will run the sweep. And what's happening here is, the signal generator is outputting to one channel of the scope, giving a reference, and then it's comparing um, two of my other channels, which are connected to the amplifiers against that reference to plot both its adherence to the, um, the same amplitude that's being output from this, as well as its phase in relationship to the output of the generator. So let's go ahead and start this, and I will be speeding this up uh, because this takes quite a while. So here we go. Okay, the sweep is finished, so let's take a look at it. So I'm gonna be changing um, the, the ratio at which we look at this so that it's easier to see what's going on. So I've got it on a one dB scale, which means that each one of these lines represents a one dB change. So um, 
usually a, uh, um, a roll off frequency is calculated at the negative 3 dB down point. What I'm going to do here is just bring this kind of into one center line so that we can see it. These other curves are the phase. But the important thing to notice here is how closely these channels track to one another. So there's, there's a blue and a yellow trace here in the middle that are basically overlaid on top of one another, which is um, exactly what we want to see. But if we look right at this line, this is 6.84. That's just my reference. So if we think about that as 0 dB, we can see how closely this amplifier tracks to that frequency response. And it doesn't start dipping till looks like around maybe 6 kilohertz. And then at, at 10K, we're getting down maybe 12K. We're at negative 1 dB. And negative 3 dB is all the way down here past looks about like 35 kilohertz. So overall, the frequency response in these is great. Um, it may actually be a little bit flatter than this. I'm, you know, not all my parameters are under control here as far as um, impedance matching and things like that. But what I can say is that these things are tracking extremely close to one another for both phase and uh, frequency. So that's, that's what we're looking for working on a mono black block pair. So I'm really happy with how these came out. So while we're on the topic of frequency response, I wanted to look at a couple different ways to look at frequency response. And also we can look at the, uh, the low pass filter that's built into this amplifier as well. So what I'm going to do is just increase my, um, my signal level. Oh, I'm at 12 kilohertz. Let me take this back to 1 kilohertz. It's more of a typical place to do these type of measurements. I need to adjust the scope here. And I'm going to increase my amplitude so that I can get to this subdivision here. There we go. So I've got both of my waveforms overlaid and they are right at this line here. What I'm gonna do on the signal generator is basically simulate what we're doing with that, um, with that plot. So as I increase the frequency, our goal is that the amplitude remains the same. You can see that around 12 kilohertz, my amplitude is starting to drop. And by the time we get to 20 kilohertz, it's, it's shrunk down a little bit. But the main thing is that throughout this process, both my channels are tracking near identically. If we take this in the other direction, at 500 hertz, I'm continuing to drop. And we can see that we're maintaining that amplitude. 100 hertz, 90. Now down to 20 hertz, and you can see how flat it is in the, in the lower range. I'm gonna take this down to, let's say, 14 hertz, and then I'm going to flip the low filter on one of these. So we can say, see when that filter comes into place, it changes the, both the amplitude and the phase of the low frequency. And this is to roll off low frequencies um, to prevent uh, turntable rumble and things like that. So there we are back to normal. And then one other way that I like to look at frequency response at the bench, just as a quick reference, is looking at square wave response. So I'm back to one kilohertz to here, and I'm going to change the response or the, the waveform to a square. And on a square wave at one kilohertz, a perfect amplifier will have a very um, smooth cutoff at both, at both sides. We can see a rounding on this half of the waveform. And what that represents is uh, that little dip in high frequency response. So those are a couple different ways to look at frequency response. I just wanted to give that as an example. And while we're set up in this method, I did want to demonstrate the phase switch. So remember I mentioned that the phase switch is used for configuring a, um, a center channel with these amplifiers. So when we flip this phase switch, it gives us a waveform that's 180 degrees out of phase with the, uh, with the input signal. Now, my guess is when you configure this for a center channel, you'd be required to adjust the volume level on the other amplifier in order to balance this out perfectly. So in this case, you would have to, again, plug your speakers on one of the amplifiers in, in reverse, so that the left and right channels maintain uh, the same phase, but the center channel would be um, out of phase, allowing the L plus R signal to be reproduced. All right, next we'll move on to some uh, THD measurements. And for that, I need to hook up my low distortion Tektronix oscillator. Okay, so this final test is going to be testing THD plus N at rated power. 
Now, my, my setup here is for testing stereo amplifiers with a shared ground in the same chassis. So it hasn't been working very well testing both mono blocks at the same time. The results are not accurate. So I'm just gonna show the left channel by itself here. So what I have going on here is a low distortion oscillator, a Tektronix SG505, which is rated at about 0.008%. And starting with a very low distortion signal means the, the measured um, distortion is going to be more accurate. So I'm feeding that signal into the input of the left amplifier and I'm just going to increase its amplitude until we get to 23.6 volts RMS. So right around there is 70 watts. Take this back to THD plus N and right about 0.6%. This is rated in the mid frequency, so around one kilohertz, rated at 0.1% THD, so we're within spec here. Um, and then if I went down to say 100 hertz, you can see we're at a little over 0.1%. The spec sheet says 0.33% uh, is allowable for uh, the entire frequency range. So overall, this one is performing really well, and it's a pass on that specification as well. So that's about it for the bench testing. Thanks again for stopping by the channel and checking out this, um, this video on the Marantz 9, one of my favorite tube amplifiers. If you like this content, I encourage you to subscribe and come back for future videos. And we will see you next time.